thank you very much for that uh, introduction, Tree, um, and thank you all for taking time out of your busy lives to come and uh, share a part of my life um, that I have found um, deeply, deeply moving and life-affirming. Um, I'd like to also take a moment to introduce my friend and colleague, colleague Sharon Parkinson over there. She's going to be running the uh, technical things, working the buttons, doing all the sort of things that I don't really want to be doing while I'm up here. And um, Sharon's part of the second cohort of training in existential analysis, and I'm just completing my studies in the first cohort. I have been doing workshops and studying this particular topic since 2003 and been part of a concentrated program, the first program of its kind in North America, where 20 of us um, from across North America, and actually one from Brazil, are studying under Dr. Alfred Langle, who comes from Austria and teaches existential analysis, um, usually through UBC. Um, and Sharon's part of the second cohort, so. Um, I'll begin this evening by trying to describe to you what it was like 21 years ago as I stepped into the fresh spring air and breathed life for the first time in so long. I had just finished 30 days of treatment for drug and alcohol abuse and I had come out of the hospital in Kingston, Ontario and truly, truly felt alive. <coughs> and it was just eight weeks before that when I was in my car headed towards a bridge, doing approximately 150 kilometers an hour, sure that the only way that I could end the pain that I caused others and the pain that I was in would be to take my own life. And right near the, the fail-safe moment, that moment when you can't turn around, when there's no way back, a little voice came up inside me and said, what if you're wrong? And it was a quiet voice, but it was so clear. And I remember pulling off to the side of the road and just shaking um, and crying. And I had to ask myself then, do I want to live? And I was surprised at the answer, and I was surprised at how readily the answer came to me. It was yes, I do, but not like this. I had to come up with a how. If I'm going to live, how am I going to live? And that led me to find a way into treatment and led me to, armed with my grade 10 education, to go back to school um, when I was in my mid-30s and pursue the career I've, um, I've taken on to answer that question, how, and to help others find the answer themselves. My friend and mentor and teacher, Dr. Alfred Langle, who actually came up with the model of existential analysis, says, the, attempt, the essential task of existence is to find this correspondence between our potential for participation, for creativity, action, and encounter, and what is possible, needed, and undone, and what we see, feel, and understand to be waiting for us, despite the possibility of risk and error. And by undone, he means those things that we have yet to do. Existential analysis, or, or EA, is defined as a phenomenological person-oriented psychotherapy whose aim <coughs> is to lead the person to a mentally and emotionally free experience or experiences. It helps us facilitate authentic decisions and it is this is so essential, it helps us bring about a truly responsible way of dealing with life and the world. Alfred has uncovered, Alfred, Alfred truly believes that, that that which is in the world is to be uncovered. There's nothing to be invented, it's already here. Um, and he's uncovered the four fundamental structures of existence, the world with its limits, possibilities and facticity, and existentialists like to use fancy words often, and facticity just means those things that are in the world that actually are there. Um, life with its network of relationships and feelings. Being oneself in our uniqueness and autonomy, that which makes me me, 
and what, what makes you, you. And future and meaning, the wider context in which we, excuse me, act and find meaning. And he goes on to talk about four fundamental motivations. The first fundamental motivation is to be motivated by the fundamental question of existing in the world. I think we can all agree we exist, but can we exist as a whole person? Do I have the necessary space, protection, and support? Remember, we're thrown into the world. I didn't ask to be here. I didn't ask for my life to be where I found it. Can I be here? The second motivation, we're, we're motivated by the fundamental question of life. I'm alive, I can be alive, but do I like it? Do I experience fulfillment, affection, and appreciation of values? Third, we're motivated by the fundamental question of self. I am myself, but do I feel free to be myself? Do I experience attention, justice, and appreciation? Is it okay to be this unique me, with this body, with this gender, with this brain? Is it okay to be me? And the fourth motivation, we're motivated by the question of existential meaning. And perhaps we've all asked this question. I'm here. But why? For what purpose? What makes my life meaningful and whole? What am I living for? And a model's good as a model, but it it's not that helpful if it can't be applied. And what I've found most beneficial about existential analysis is how I can apply it in everyday life and how I can apply it in therapy with clients. So the goal of therapy is to analyze the necessary life conditions in which values have their place. And any client of mine will know that the first or second question I ask, what are your values? I don't know of a single person who's come through my door, who hasn't been struggling with some crisis of value. Either they can't live in accordance with their own values because someone's suppressing and not allowing that to happen, or they're living their life against their values. We hope to develop the client's perceptiveness and activity throughout the four fundamental motivations that I just talked about. And it, it, it's important that it provides a framework to situate and treat psychological and emotional problems. So there, I, I have to have a framework that I understand in order to do therapy well, and this is the framework. And it allows um, me to see and understand anxiety, depression, phobias, personality disorders, addictions, meaningless suicidality. It has treatment modality for all of those possibilities. And it's important uh, at this stage to at least highlight a couple of key therapeutic terms. Uh, phenomenology, and phenomenology is actually, it's quite simple to explain, quite difficult to do. Um, phenomenology is simply the idea of bracketing out preconceptions, thoughts, ideas, ways of seeing the world, expectations, all of that, so that when the client sits down, or when the person sits across from you, you hear and see the phenomenon as he or she presents it, or in this case, the person. So that you're, you're able to meet that person where they are, hear that story in a unique way, as if it was heard for the first time. Even, and the hard part, of course, is even though, in the back of my mind, of course, I've got the framework, understanding that if I'm hearing someone say, oh, I'm, just, I, I'm, I'm so anxious, I can't, there's a piece of me that says, oh, fundamental motivation one. If I, how many times in a week have I heard someone walk in and say, Bruce, I, I don't like my life. Ah, fundamental motivation two, depression. And those things come up right away, and the idea is to sort of, for me, is to bracket them out 
and hear the story and experience the phenomenon as it's presented. Authenticity. You will hear ex existentialists talk about authenticity all the time. Um, it's that personal originality, that which makes us irreplaceable and non-representable in all existential matters. So for me, life is about matching freedom and responsibility. And in, in that way, um, I am existentially responsible for this life. I'm not responsible for Michael's life. I'm not responsible for Sharon's life. I'm not responsible for anyone else's, but I am responsible for mine. And I'm free in that responsibility to act in and with my own values. Inner consent, that's a congruence between oneself and one's actions. And in existential or EA, we talk about an inner yes to life. I'm in this life. Am I giving myself to this life? Can I say yes? I know that when I go to work, I can say yes. I'm not lending myself to a job that doesn't matter to me. I'm doing what I want to do, and I stand behind myself, and I can say yes to my life. There's no fulfillment without consent, and where it is lacking, there may be psychopathology. So where that inner consent is lacking is where we tend to come with our own coping reactions, and uh, an easier term would be sort of defense mechanisms on how we battle against life. Because we haven't given an inner consent. We haven't said yes. If I accept life, and I accept who I am in life, and I've given my inner consent, I've got no reason to come up with coping reactions. I've not got no reason to come up with defense mechanisms. I'm fully engaged in my life, and I agree with my life. There's an inner and outer dialogue, and I talk about this with clients um, often. Um, and that's the ongoing constant process where we find life in ourselves, and we find life in the world. And I don't know if you find yourself doing that. You touch inside. How is that for me? How is it in the world? How am I in the world? How am I seen in the world? Does the world see me the way I see me? Does it fit this way that I am with the world? And there's a constant inner and outer dialogue. Um, and when that dialogue is in harmony, again, there's no need for a coping reaction, no need for defense mechanisms. This, this, this one's kind of mine. Um, and kind of mine because if I see one uh, struggle again and again and again in my office, it's this inability, unwillingness to not accept life as it is. And so people will say, life is about happiness, life is fun, life is suffering. Life is, and I cut it. Life is. Whether I'm in it or not, life is. The stream of life goes, and it simply is. And it's been my experience that life does not care one whit that I suffer, and that it has never been wise for me to ask, why me? Why me? Why was I left at the hospital? Why was I adopted into a family where I was unloved? Why did I waste 15, 20 years of my life in addiction? That, that question has never been answerable because I wasn't the creator. I found myself in my life. I didn't organize the rest of it. I can't find the why. The question has always been for me, how? If this is so, how do I live my life? And so it's that question of how do I live my life that I, with my arm, with my grade 10 education, and mind you, it was Ontario, so it's quite a bit higher. <laughs> <laughs> Armed with that education, I ask that question. How? Can't live my life like this. How can I live it? So that has been my path from that moment forward with myself and with my clients and with my friends to help understand the how. Um, I'd like to close with, with a quote that has meant a great deal to me uh, over the years. And it's also, it, it's also demonstrated something for me. Isaiah Berlin is one of my favorite philosophers. And 
Um, he writes, I wish above all to be conscious of myself as a thinking, willing, active being, bearing responsibility for my choices, and able to explain them by reference to my own ideas and purposes. And, you know, until two weeks ago, when I was putting this presentation together, I would have had that tattooed on my butt. Like, I really, really thought that included everything. And then I realized when I put it up on the screen, it's missing the, an essential core. Nowhere in that, in, in that quote does it talk about feelings. And as human beings, we are feeling beings. And I can assure you that if you take the time to follow your feelings, your feelings will guide you to your values, and your values will guide you to a life of inner consent. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.